Hey everyone, welcome back to Kristen's Epic Adventures. Today we're going to be talking about Humblewood again. Now we did a previous video on what's in the Humblewood box where we unboxed everything to show you what was in that. I got Humblewood as a Kickstarter, but it is available for purchase now. So today I thought we would actually go over the bird folk versus the humble folk and some of the things that are actually in the campaign setting. So make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know when the new videos are up. And if you found this content helpful, share it on your social media and go ahead and hit that like button and give us a thumbs up so more friends can find us. Welcome back everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Humblewood setting and the different races that are available for you to make characters out of in this campaign setting. Now, they've kind of divided them into two different types of groups. Then we'll go over each one individually in another video series. Uh, we previously showed you what was in the box, so we're kind of getting more and more and more specific until you decide if you'd like to do the Humblewood campaign. Um, I'm hopefully going to be running it for some friends of mine real soon. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be super cute with these little animal races. Although I think you'll see in a minute they're not little. <laughs> um, so jumping right in, I want you to know that even though this is a setting where you're playing animals, they're not animal sized. The bird folk and the humble folk both resemble animals, but they are considered humanoids. If you are playing a bird or like a fox or a raccoon, they are not the size of an actual animal in our world, but they are anywhere between like three and six feet tall. Okay, so these are still considered humanoids, uh, even in the Humblewood setting. All right, so we've got bird folk and we've got humble folk. Let's go over what the differences are. So bird folk, and yes, those are your bird races. Um, they actually live in settlements known as perches throughout the woods, which I thought was pretty cute. Now these birds, remember I said they are not bird sized in our world. They are between like five and three to five feet tall. So they are not actually capable of flying. Um, it's not like when you are a druid in D&D &D and can, can like druid shape into like an eagle and actually fly around. These races, um, the bird races, cannot flap their wings and fly around and fly around the whole world. What they do is they have a feature, uh, because they have wings and feathers, is they can glide. Now, gliding is literally just them falling a certain distance and controlling it with their wings and their feathers and not taking any damage when they reach the ground. Um, there are a few that can actually propel themselves upward by flapping their wings, but it's not where they can actually take the flight and fly around. They're just kind of, like I said, propelling themselves upwards a little bit, maybe to get up into a perch or up on a, you know, something higher up. There are also some races that have talons um, and those can actually be either used as weapons or used to help in climbing something that talons would be able to grip. So that's pretty cool. Now in this world, bird folk actually are the established political force in Humblewood, okay? They have established the capital city of the world and it's actually in a great tree called the Alder Heart. Looks pretty cool. Um, they are the ruling government body, which is known as the Bird Folk Council. And they provide, like, I suppose you would call it the military or the police, known as the Perch Guard, which is pretty neat, I thought, too. Those are your soldiers that are keeping everybody safe and keeping the peace and everything. Now, as far as what's available for bird-like races, you have a lot of really different interesting things to pick from. So first we have Corvum, which are your crow-like creatures. Then we have Gallus. Hopefully there's no glare. Gallus, which are like your wild fowls. Now this one here does look like a chicken, but you can, it says, do anything from like a pheasant to a grouse to a chicken to a turkey. So totally up to you what your character looks like. This one just looks like a chicken. Then we have Luma which look like your doves or pigeons. 
We've got raptors, which are your hawks, eagles, or any other birds of prey that you would like to be. And then these I think are super cute. You've got strigs, which are your owl-like creatures. Now this one <laughs> is an owl in kind of like a little cat suit, which is just adorable. But, um, so I don't know if when you looked at that, you could tell that that was an owl, but strigs are your owl-like creatures, okay? Now, when you switch over to humble folk, and just kind of giving an overview of each one, bird folk versus humble folk, maybe it's kind of going to give you an insight into, okay, first off, I know I really want to play one of these bird creatures, or I really want to play one of these humble folk creatures, and then you could narrow it down into which race you actually want to play. So the main difference um, between the two is that your bird folk, right, are living in perches, mostly, like most of them. Uh, they said live up in the perches in the trees. They said there's a few who uh, will live down on the ground with the humble folk, but it's considered very uncouth. Um, so your humble folk refers to all your non-bird folk that live closer to the florist floor. Floor, the forest floor. <laughs> um, now the different types of humble folk, it said, do not see as eye to eye as the birds do. Apparently all the bird folk get along very, very well not necessarily so with the humble folk. Now, a little bit of history that's given in the campaign setting is that ages ago there was a treaty called the Humble Folk Treaty that was struck between the people of the forest floor to try to unite against bandits and infighting, okay? Um, so most of these humble folk creatures live in woodland villages beneath the trees. Now, it did also say that at one point the treaty was expanded to allow the humble folk to call upon the perch guard, right? Which is, remember, your soldiers protecting the world uh, up in the bird area. So that in times of crisis, the humble folk could call upon them for help. Now, what happened was some fires started to spread throughout the land and destroy everything. The humble folk tried to call upon the perch guard for help, but the fires, there were so many fires, they spread so fast, the perch guard was spread so thin that they really couldn't keep up with what was going on. Uh, but the humble folk didn't necessarily really see it that way. So some of them left to join this bandit coalition either for a couple reasons, either for pure survival, because I remember I said the infighting, maybe they just really were like not getting along with somebody for their own survival. They left and joined the bandit coalition or to try to get even with the birds for breaking their oath of what the, when they signed the treaty that they would protect them. Now, it kind of hinted at the fact that, like I said, the, the bird, uh, the perch guard was just spread too thin. It wasn't that they didn't want to help, but the humble folk kind of took it that way. Okay, now your races of humble folk, super cute here too, you've got your servin, which are your deer-like creatures. And they can, it said they can actually be with antlers or without. There's two different sub-races that have, so one has antlers and the other one does not. You've got your hedge, which is like a hedgehog or a porcupine. Okay. Then you've got gerbean, which are your mice. They are adorable. Next we have mapatch or mopatch. Those are your raccoon creatures. And lastly, we have vulpin. I think these are really neat too. That's your fox, your fox-like creatures, okay? So all the information on playing any of these types of races are here in the um, campaign handbook. And I actually am going to go over each race, all the different things and abilities that it has in some other videos, okay? But also, what you're going to find in the campaign book here is um, some new class options. Oh, first let me mention to you, it does say that everyone here speaks bird folk. So all the birds speak bird folk. All the humble folk speak whatever language their race is, like the raccoons speak the raccoon language, but everybody also speaks bird folk. So they said bird folk is kind of replacing common. It's like in the place of common. Now, this is just a campaign setting that is 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons compatible. 
This still means that you need the player's handbook for the rules. It uses the rules in the handbook. Um, you're still going to need like a dun your dungeon master guide, your monster manual, and this is just a campaign setting and it does have an adventure in it too though. Um, but this can't like replace, there's no like different set of rules in here. This still uses your 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons rules. All right, so also in here we've got some new class options. So, and these are in addition to the player's handbook. Um, the Bard has a new class option called College of the Road. And just quickly, it's kind of like a, um, a traveler who's been on the road for so long and met so many different people and talked to everybody that it's an unofficial college of just all the knowledge that they've gained while they were on the road. It has a really neat main feature of learning these traveler's tricks. There's 10 different traveler's tricks to choose from, and as your bard levels up, you get to know two of them, and then three of them, and then four of them. They seem really neat. Also, there's two new domains for clerics. We've got the community domain, which really focuses on family and friendship, and it has some new channel divinity features. And then a knight domain, which focuses on like the mysterious and the cover of darkness. Uh, that domain has a bunch of new spells in this book for knight domain clerics. Uh, at, some, at certain levels, they're actually gonna acquire true sight, which is really neat. And it has features like your shad shadows envelop you and people trying to attack you have disadvantage, neat things like that. Uh, lastly, there is a new archetype for the fighter that's actually called Scofflaw. This sounds really neat too. It's actually fighters that balk at tradition and honor and do what they need to do to survive. Um, they are really good at using improvised weapons in addition to the regular weapons. And they have a feature in here where you can break improvised weapons over your opponent to do damage or convince them to attack others instead of you, which is pretty neat. Uh, there's also three new backgrounds. There is a bandit defector, obviously someone who used to be in the bandit coalition and then defected. And then we have um, Grounded and Wind Touched. Now, Grounded is a character that has peace of mind on the ground rather than up in the tree canopy. And likewise, Wind Touched is uh, a character who only feels at ease high in the tree canopy and not so much down on the ground. And when you get those backgrounds, it does offer, same way the player's handbook does, different, um, you know, like flaws, and values and things like that that you can either choose or roll for, things like that. There are also in this uh, setting seven new feats to choose from if your uh, DM decides that feats are available for you. I'm not gonna go over what each one does, but they are called Aerial Expert, Bandit Cunning, Heavy Glider, Opportunistic Thief, Perfect Landing, Speech of the Ancient Beasts, and Woodwise. So those sound really neat. Also, the book contains 10, not seven, I was gonna say seven again, 10 new spells. And you know how sometimes spells are on a couple different uh, classes lists? So two of them are for the bard, four for the cleric, eight for the druid, one for the paladin, five for the ranger, three for the sorcerer, three for the warlock, and four for the wizard. Um, but there are just 10 total new spells in the book which are really neat that kind of um in addition to all the spells you have available in your player's handbook these are specific to the setting where they're very woodland based or uh, bird based or creature based things like that they're really neat there is also if you want to create your own campaign from this setting you don't have to do the adventure in here there is a whole chapter on religion and the different gods that the creatures worship there is an entire map of the world. Um, but if you'd like, there is an adventure in here as well. It takes your characters from levels one through five. It is set up uh, so that they, you can use milestone leveling. Uh, that's what's suggested. But all the XP for everything is given in there as well. If you are just a diehard, no, we XP level in my game. You could do that too. There are 13 new monsters in here. And there are 33 NPCs in here and a guide to create your own NPCs if you want to do more homebrew within the Humblewood uh, campaign. 
Then there is also way at the end, there is a random encounter table, which I always find those helpful, and a what did they find table in case maybe they're rummaging through an NPC's backpack or something. So there's a lot of really cool stuff in here. Like I said, we're also gonna do a video series on each race and what each race gets, the different subclasses if there are any, so that you can even further make a decision and decide which of the new races in Humblewood you would like to play. So if you found this content helpful, do me a favor and hit the like button, give us a thumbs up so more of our friends can find us and join our community. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you know when the new videos are up. Hit the notification bell so you know when they're posted and live. And we'll see you next time with another Humblewood video. Thanks, guys. Bye.